with the 6th Airborne Division in Normandy by Lieutenant General R. N. Gale, CB, DSO, OBE, MC. Chapter 6. The Assault. We move to the concentration areas. Eventually, the day arrived when we, that is, all the Allied generals, were to meet at St. Paul's School, there to have the plan unfolded, and there to discuss our various roles, problems, and our reactions, should events not turn out exactly as we had planned them. I sat next to Major General, now Lieutenant General, Matthew Ridgway, the Commanding General of the 82nd United States Airborne Division. General Omar Bradley had commanded this famous division before it changed to its airborne role. It had already won its spurs as an airborne division under Matt Ridgway in Sicily. I took an immediate liking to Matt, and was impressed then by his charm, as well as by his obvious moral strength. This acquaintanceship was to ripen into a great friendship, which I was to value very highly when I later became Deputy Commander of the 1st Allied Airborne Army. In the airborne operations for the crossing of the Rhine in March 1945, I acted as deputy commander to him when he was commanding the 18th United States Airborne Corps, in which, for this operation, the 6th Airborne Division was serving, by this time under the spirited command of Major General Eric Bowles. There, too, were the American generals Taylor and Gavin, names that were to make history in Holland and at Bastogne. I was deeply impressed by General Collins, fresh from his laurels so gallantly earned in the Pacific. He propounded with a wonderful vigour and clarity his proposed operations for the capture of Cherbourg. The air was quite electric while Collins stood on the platform. Typical of so many American soldiers whom it was my privilege to meet and to serve with, he gave out a feeling of confidence which was both stimulating and catching. General Montgomery introduced into the discussion various pertinent questions as to what commanders would do in the event of the unexpected happening and landings, assaults, etc., not going quite as well as we might have hoped. All these situations, as one might suppose, were more than adequately dealt with. At the end of the historic meeting, the Prime Minister came in. He listened intently as the Commander-in-Chief summed up, and then at the end he spoke to us. He was obviously overcome by the greatness of the occasion, and he made no bones about his views on the subject. I shall never forget his fierce fighting conclusion, when he told us we were not invading Europe in order to stake claims on bits of territory, which we must be prepared to hold, but we were invading Europe with the object of carrying the offensive war right into the heart of Germany, on and on relentlessly, until Hitler and the German army were once and for all thrashed and beaten. We left that meeting at St Paul's, confident in our leaders, confident in our plan, confident in our allies, and confident in ourselves. The armies, American and British, moved into their concentration areas. For us, camps had been constructed around the mass of airfields from which we were to take off. 38 Group, who carried the coup de main parties, towed all our gliders and dropped the 5th Parachute Brigade, were based on airfields at Bryce Norton, Tarrant Rushton, Fairford, Keyville and Harwell, whilst 46 Group, who carried the 3rd Parachute Brigade, flew from Blakehill Farm, Down Ampney and Broadwell. All the mass of work, connected with the fixing up of these camps, manning them and looking after us in them, had been undertaken by the Airborne Forces establishments, under the command of Brigadier E.W.C. Flavel. It was he who took the 1st Parachute Brigade to North Africa, where for his splendid work he received the DSO. He was then brought home to take over the important duties of commander airborne establishments. These included the Airborne Depot and the Airborne Forces Development Centre, where all our experiments took place. Naturally, his expert and first-hand knowledge of what was required in concentration camps for airborne troops was of the greatest help now. I had, during the early days of the training of the division, also gleaned much from him in my talks concerning the experiences of his brigade in North Africa. These airborne concentration areas, or camps as we called them, presented many problems peculiar to us. For example, in the case of a non-airborne division, the whole unit, cooks, quartermaster sergeants, and all the rest go into the same camp. From this they move on as a body into their ships for the sea voyage. With us the problem was complicated by the fact that part of our units flew into battle, whilst the remainder, the administrative tail as we called it, would come over by sea. The camps for those going by air were located well inland, 
and on or in immediate proximity to the airfields from which they were to take off. The administrative tail had, however, to concentrate in camps near the ports of embarkation. Thus, for some days prior to departure, the unit and its administrative elements were separated. This postulated a separate and ad hoc organisation in all our camps for such duties of camp administration as sanitation, cooking and the like. It was Flavel's soldiers who had to perform these duties, and right thoroughly and well they did do their tasks. It was hard for them, knowing that they could not accompany us, and we all appreciated the selfless way they did their work. Once in these camps, no one was allowed out. They were wired in, and all communication with the outside world was cut off. Men were put on their honour, and our security police checked up on everything that went on. It was the greatest credit to all that not one single case of breach of discipline occurred. The temptation must have been, and indeed was, great. We had some grand fellows in the camp with us. I referred to the war correspondents. These men had previously undergone their parachute training, and some of them had, with the object of getting to know the officers and men, been attached to units and brigades in the division. Up to this time they, of course, knew nothing of the plan. It was obvious, however, that it would help them greatly to understand the reasons for all that they would see if they knew the picture as a whole. The importance of time, and in some cases overriding everything else, would thus be apparent as would the relative value of each task. They could in fact see reason in what might appear an untidy and objectless series of events. Before we implained, I had them into my tent and told them the whole divisional plan, insofar as it would help them to understand the why and the wherefore of what they would be seeing. They dropped into action with us, and among the early reports which they sent back were accurate and true stories, based on what they, for the most part, had seen with their own eyes. Chester Wilmot, the BBC commentator, as well as Leonard Mosley, Guy Byam, and all the rest, made some very good friends in the 6th Airborne Division. In all airborne operations we go in for very detailed briefing of the troops. We had special briefing tents in the camps, and where we could get them, huts. In these were models, blown up or enlarged air photographs, in which every detail could be seen, as well as maps, sketches and drawings. Here also they received those significant little escape packets, containing maps, a compass and food tablets. Many were to make use of these. The men were told everything, not only the details of what was to be expected of them, but also the larger plan. They were allowed to discuss among themselves their tasks, and how they were going to carry them out. It was quite a sight to watch them in groups talking their problems over, their officers moving about among them, to answer their eager questions. This briefing is of course necessary, because when they drop they may, many of them, not come down just where they expected to land. The enemy may be where he has not been foreseen, and the defences may be different. Obviously, unless each man has a thorough grasp of what it is all about and what is expected of him, he will not be able to act surely, quickly and with an intelligent confidence. This policy of briefing has the untold blessings that will always accrue when men are taken completely into the confidence of their leaders. The result is the full development of a personal sense of responsibility. I like the term briefing and prefer it to the more generally used term the issue of orders. Orders, of course, have to be issued they must, too, be clear, crisp and free from all ambiguity. But the atmosphere of briefing is what counts. In this briefing, the order comes first, then follows the discussion and explanation of the why and the wherefore of everything. A day or so before we were to take off, I flew round all the camps and addressed all the officers and men. They were in great heart, cheerful, expectant and ready for anything. By now, we only had to wait for D-Day and this was dependent on weather. In fact, the weather, which had been ideal, broke, and postponement seemed inevitable. We knew the hopelessness of attempting this great undertaking in bad weather conditions. To drop parachutists in winds of over 25 miles an hour is to court very heavy casualties, and gliders in a high wind might well get all over the place, break their tow ropes, and come down anywhere. As our operation was to take place at night, a reasonable degree of visibility was obviously of the greatest importance. Fortunately, the conditions that would favour us would also favour the seaborne assault. The mass of shipping that had collected for this great venture could not hope to remain unseen for long and indefinitely be unmolested. We knew, therefore, that indefinite postponement was most unlikely. On the night of the 4th of June, I went to bed fairly early. Sleep was wanted. 
Lord knows when the next night in bed would be possible, and a tired commander is not much used to his troops. About midnight, Tom Horton came up to me with a top-secret message. It contained but one word, and that in code. The operation was to take place. This time, tomorrow night, we would be on our way to France. It is hard to describe one's feelings at a time like that. I think mine was one of intense relief. I turned over, and contrary to what I had expected, fell into a sound sleep. So I think did most of the others. It was many a night before we were to have such another. The next day was spent in briefing the pilots, who up till the last were kept out of the secret. Maps, photographs, charts and films were all shown and pored over by anxious air crews. Tasks in particular were studied and navigators calculated and recalculated their tasks. That evening, our last in England, I gave them a short talk on the army plan. I tried in a few words to explain why we wanted our gliders and our parachute troops where we did. I told them how it was that we should want our anti-tank guns, probably badly, in the morning. And how strange it sounded. Yes, I said, we shall want those guns badly tomorrow morning. There was a roar of laughter. It sounded so strange. Tomorrow morning, in that quiet briefing room in England. My glider was to be flown by Major Griffiths, who, expert glider pilot though he is, will be known probably more as a great cricketer and wicket-keeper than as a glider pilot. We went aboard the glider and went all through our ditching drill, just in case. My tug aircraft was to be piloted by Wing Commander, now Group Captain McNamara, and was to be an Albemarle aircraft. McNamara and I had a lot in common, not only our interest in airborne matters, but our love of sailing, for he, like myself, was a keen yachtsman. Major General Crawford, then Director of Air at the War Office, came down to our airfield at Harwell to give us his blessing. In order to get a first-hand impression of the operation, he flew in McNamara's aircraft, just to see, as he so typically put it, that old Richard gets there all right. The rapid takeoff of a mass of gliders is a complex business. The gliders are all drawn up closely packed on either side of the runway. Their long tow ropes are all carefully laid out. All the tug aircraft then come onto the runway and are connected up to their own gliders. Then they start off, each following the other in quick succession. What a roar of engines as they rev up. Down the runway they speed, nearly 2,000 yards they will want before they become airborne. The gliders get unstuck first, and then up goes the tug. The aircraft climb terrifyingly slowly with the appalling all-up weight they have behind. Will they clear the hills or the trees ahead? Yes, they do. The glider keeps stationed, flying just above and out of the slipstream of the aircraft tugging it. When all this is to be done at night, the strain on all, aircraft pilots, glider pilots, the ground staff responsible for the laying out of tow ropes and connecting the right glider to the right tug, is great indeed. The troops in their gliders are for the most part blissfully ignorant of all this. Their minds are on their own task ahead. Before we took off, Sir Trafford Lee Mallory came round all the stations to bid us farewell and success in our venture. Among others who came down to see us was Wing Commander Dennis Wheatley, who was at that time employed in the War Cabinet offices. He brought with him a bottle of the most delicious hock I ever remembered tasting, and in this he drank to our health and our success. I am by nature superstitious. I was therefore very touched when, as a token or talisman of good fortune, he gave me a small crusader sword. This I believe he had had for years. On my last exercise in England, I had the good fortune to pick up a four-leafed clover. Superstition is a very funny thing, and I am never quite sure how deep it runs. All I do know is that there is so much in life that is without apparent reason, so much that is completely unforeseeable, so much that just baffles reason, that I do not laugh at little superstitious fads. Take-off and landing in France The first to take off were the coup de main and the independent parachute company. All the men had their faces blackened so that they should not show up in the dark. This advance guard left us with our heartfelt prayers and our blessings. The invasion had begun. That night the moon shone. The sky was clear as one by one the great aircraft, boosting up their engines, roared down the runways. Next to go were the two parachute brigades and the engineers accompanying them. Then our turn came. My glider was number 70. I was accompanied by my ADC, Tom Horton, David Baird, my GSO2, my personal escort, my signaller and my driver, and Rifleman Gray, Tom's Batman. In the glider also were my jeep with wireless set and two motorcycles. There were twelve of us in all. 
before us lay in an hour and a half's flight. We were to land just north of Ronville, in the area captured by Nigel Poet and his brigade. We hoped that the sappers would have cleared away sufficient of the stakes to give us a reasonably safe landing zone. During the few days I had been on the station, I had got to know the station commander and his staff very well. I remember I had once said that I liked Treacle very much, indeed. It was a thoughtful, friendly, and very charming gesture, therefore, when Group Captain Surplus handed me a tin of Treacle to take to France, just as I was in planing. In the glider we all wore May Wests, and taking our places we all fastened ourselves in and waited for the jerk as the tug took the strain of the tow rope. Soon it came, and we could feel ourselves hurtling down the smooth tarmac. Then we were airborne, and once again we heard the familiar whistle as the air rushed by and we glided higher and higher into the dark night. I suppose all men have different reactions on these occasions. I went to sleep and slept soundly for the best part of an hour. I was woken up by a considerable bumping. We had run into a small local storm in the channel. Griffiths was having a ticklish time and the glider was all over the place. Between glider and tug... There is an intercommunication line, so that the two pilots can talk to one another. In this bumping we received, the intercommunication line broke. The only means of contact for speech from the tug to the glider, or vice versa, was lost. The problem of cast-off would have to be solved by judgment. Griffiths merely said, the intercom was bust. It was only a few minutes after that he said, we will be crossing the French coast shortly. We were flying at about 5,000 feet and we soon knew the coast was under us, for we were met by a stream of flak. It was weird to see this roaring up in great golden chains past the windows of the glider, some of it being apparently between us and the tug aircraft. Looking out, I could see the canal and the river through the clouds, for the moon was by now fairly well overcast, and the clear, crisp moonlight we had hoped for was not there. Nevertheless, here we were, in a few moments, Griffith said, We are over the landing zone now, and will be cast off at any moment. Almost as soon as he had said this, we were. The whistling sound and the roar of the engine suddenly died down. No longer were we bumping about, but gliding along on a gloriously steady course. Away went the tug aircraft, with Crawford in it, back to England. Round we turned, circling lower and lower. Soon the pilot turned round to tell us to link up as we were just about to land. We all linked up by putting our arms round the man next to us. We were also, as I have said, strapped in. In case of a crash, this procedure would help us to take the shock. I shall never forget the sound as we rushed down in our final steep dive. Then we suddenly flattened out, and soon with a bump, 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 we landed on an extremely rough stubble field. Over the field we sped, and then with a bang we hit a low embankment, the forward undercarriage wheel stove up through the floor, the glider spun round on its nose, in a small circle, and as one wing hit one of those infernal stakes, we drew up to a standstill. We opened the door. Outside, all was quiet. I have given a description of this flight, because what was my experience was the experience of hundreds of others. Each man reacts within himself according to his own make-up. Others may have had impressions very different from the above. They will, therefore, I hope, forgive me, should they disagree with the impressions left on but one of their company. Immediately on landing, each man has a place to go and an allotted task. All-round defence is the first duty for some, while others attend to the unloading of the glider. About us, now, the other gliders were coming in, crashing and screeching as they applied their brakes. It was a glorious moment. In the distance from the direction of the bridges, we could now hear bursts of machine-gun fire. Except for the arrival of more and more gliders, all around us seemed to be still. It was eerie. Had Ronville been cleared of the enemy? Were the bridges taken? Were they intact and safely in our hands? How was Terence Otway and his gallant battalion faring at the Merville Battery? We could still hear intermittent fire from the direction of the bridges. Whilst they were attempting to unload the glider, the passing moments seemed like hours. It was still dark, and this unloading was proving to be more difficult than we had anticipated. The crash we had had, though not serious, resulted in the nose being really well dug into the ground and the problem of getting the jeep out was defeating us. Eventually we had to give it up. And so, on foot, we set out for Ronville. Soon dawn commenced to break, just a few yellow streaks towards the east, and in a short time it would be daylight. A figure loomed up before me that I would always recognise anywhere. 
It was Nigel Poet. He had successfully captured the bridges. The glider coup de main landings had worked like a charm. Pine Coffin, with the 7th Battalion, was now on the west bank, where there was still some fighting. This was the machine-gun fire, which we had heard. Ronville was in our hands, though he didn't think the whole place was as yet fully clear of the Germans. However, Peter Luard, with the 13th Battalion, was in Ronville, and on his way to Hero-Viette. Johnston, with the 12th Battalion, was holding the southern outskirts of Ronville. The Chateau Grounds, where I was to establish my headquarters, was clear of the Bosch. Poet's headquarters were established in a farm between the Chateau and the bridges. So this part of our plan had worked. It was just before it was getting light that we heard sounds from the side of the road. Difficult at first to interpret. We stopped and we listened. Was it a party of Germans? We kept still and waited. I don't know whether we were relieved, disappointed or merely amused when we discovered it was only a horse grazing, as unconcerned with the great adventure being enacted around it as it could be. I took the toggle rope from around my waist, and using it as a halter, took the horse along with me. I wasn't quite sure what I was going to do with it, but it made the men laugh and it amused me. The next day the poor brute was killed by a German mortar bomb, and we buried it in the grounds of the chateau. It was daylight by the time we reached Ronville, and knocked on the front door of the chateau. The poor people inside had not the remotest idea what it was all about. They were, I think, doubly mystified because the Germans, by all the coincidences in the world, had apparently been carrying out an anti-invasion exercise that very night. Rommel, they told us, was in the area of the German headquarters in Le Plain. They were very frightened, these people, but very kind. They did not know at the time whether this was just a raid or the real and long-awaited-for invasion. Would we just come and then go? Then, when the Germans returned, would they have to pay the price of sheltering us? Whatever their thoughts, they never faltered. The people of Normandy are a great, stalwart people, not effusive, but loyal and true to the bone. How much they really suffered only they can know. They deserve much credit, and our grateful thanks. They certainly have won the hearts of all of us in the 6th Airborne Division. All objectives taken. In the meantime, what of the earlier landings by Poet's Brigade? Just after midnight, the six gliders carrying the coup de main party of one company of the 52nd, under the command of Major R.J. Howard, were released, and five of them came into land at their appointed places near the bridges, Sketch B. The leading glider for the Canal Bridge, piloted by Staff Sergeant J.H. Woolwalk, Glider Pilot Regiment, and carrying Major Howard, came in with perfect accuracy, and pulled up only twenty yards from the bridge itself, with its nose well into the wire of the defences. The other two gliders for this bridge were only a few feet away. The night at this hour was fine, and although the moon was overcast, visibility was between thirty and forty yards. Lieutenant H.D. Brotheridge's platoon were in the first glider. They worked their way to the road at the east end of the bridge, then, led by Brotheridge, assaulted across it to secure the far bank. The few minutes needed to get onto the road were sufficient to rouse the defences across the river, and the charge was met by machine-gun fire. There was no hesitation, however, and although Brotheridge himself was unfortunately killed, the enemy defences were rapidly overcome. The second platoon, commanded by Lieutenant D.J. Wood, were out almost simultaneously. They made for the defences on the east bank. The suddenness of the attack took the Germans completely by surprise. Wood's men were soon over the wire, and using grenades and sten guns had cleared the pillboxes and trenches. A few Germans escaped and were seen running off in a northerly direction. The third platoon, under Lieutenant R. A. A. Smith, crossed the bridge some five minutes after Brotheridge and reinforced the position on the far bank. The two platoons which had landed near the river bridge met little opposition and soon secured their objectives. Meanwhile, the sappers had been examining both bridges for demolition charges. It was found that, although the bridges had been prepared for demolition, the charges had not been placed. We later found out that these charges were kept in a house near the canal bridge. We had, it would seem, overestimated the German preparedness here. Howard's small force then consolidated their position, forming a compact bridgehead, west of the canal bridge and east of the river bridge. Here they waited for the arrival of the 7th Parachute Battalion, who were to relieve them and enlarge the bridgehead to the west. Meanwhile, as the glider landings took place, the Pathfinder aircraft carrying the Independent Parachute Company and the advanced group of parachutists of the 5th Parachute Brigade dropped their sticks north of Ronville. Poet's aircraft, 
piloted by Wing Commander McMunion, came in with perfect accuracy. The two sticks of the independent parachute company were landed a little to the east and with little time available were forced to put out their navigational signals and apparatus where they were. This inaccuracy resulted in the main body also being dropped more to the east than had been intended, but this had no serious results. The four sticks of the 7th and 13th Parachute Battalions, to whom had been allotted the task of protecting the dropping and landing zones, although dropped correctly, were very scattered and took a long time to rally. Members of these early sticks obtained a unique impression of the coup de main party's assault. The gliders were still coming in as the men of the independent parachute company jumped. Anti-aircraft shells and tracer bullets were pouring into the sky and soon illuminating flares and machine gun fire showed that the German defences were rapidly awakening. For a few minutes after the first glider touched down, the fire was intense. Then, almost as rapidly, it died down. Almost immediately, the success signal was sounded by Howard on a whistle. This was a most stirring sound to Nigel Poet and his advanced headquarters party, who had jumped in the leading aircraft with the independent parachute company. With their spirits high, they rushed to the bridges. Half an hour after the first landings north of Ronville, the main body of parachutes of the 5th Brigade arrived. The roar of 131 aircraft soon deadened other sounds. In spite of the guiding signals being slightly too far to the east, this drop was made with good accuracy. It was found, not unnaturally, that in general the sticks covered more ground than had been usual in training. This was mainly due to the difficulty the heavily laden men experienced in managing their bags, in which they carried their equipment, in aircraft which were taking evasive action. These long sticks resulted in a very wide dispersion on the dropping area, and consequent delay in the concentration of the battalions. Had it been daylight, the scene on the ground must have presented a remarkable picture. 2,000 troops of different units and all completely mixed, some disentangling themselves from their parachutes in a fairish wind, others searching for their equipment and containers. Everywhere little groups trying to locate themselves and to find their rendezvous. All the while the area was under fire from machine guns sighted on its southern edge and from sporadic mortar and shell fire. The speed and orderliness with which this jumble of human beings was sorted out into formed fighting units was a fine tribute to the steadiness and individual initiative of all ranks. The 13th Parachute Battalion had collected some 60% of its men and were ready to start their task within one hour of the first drop. The 7th and 12th Battalions each had farther to go and consequently took one and a half hours to collect. They were in approximately the same strength as the 13th. The total casualties in this brigade drop amounted to 16 killed and 82 wounded, while the number missing after rallying was completed was 432. While the rallying of the main body of Poet's troops was in progress, enemy patrols had begun to probe at the bridgehead held by Howard's small force. No serious attack took place, but the patrols increased in strength and a few tracked vehicles appeared. It seemed to the defenders that something more serious was brewing up. It was therefore with considerable relief that those on the bridges saw the leading elements of the 7th Parachute Battalion approach. Pine Coffin, commanding the 7th Parachute Battalion, realised the importance of coming quickly to the assistance of the coup de main party. He therefore left his rendezvous for the bridges without waiting for the complete concentration of his battalion. At this time, the containers carrying his heavy weapons had not been found and his wireless was also missing. The battalion passed through Howard's force and succeeded in securing their objectives on the west bank, which included Le Port and Benouville, and here they established their battle outposts. While these events had been taking place, the 13th Battalion and the 591st Parachute Squadron RE, on the other side of the river, had made good progress in the tasks assigned them. The covering parties to protect the preparation of the glider landing strips were established by a company under Major F.J. Cramphorn and the obstructing poles were cut with explosives by the sappers and removed by men of Cramphorn's company. The strips were soon ready to receive the gliders of advanced divisional headquarters. Lieutenant Colonel P.J. Leward, commanding 13th Parachute Battalion, himself supervised the mopping up of Ronville. According to the French, the normal enemy garrison of the village had been approximately one company from the 21st Panzer Division, chiefly billeted round the chateau. During the night, the bulk of this company were away from their billets but a number of defensive posts on the north side of the town, overlooking the dropping zone, were held, and miscellaneous parties of the enemy were in various houses in the village. The area was finally mopped up by about 4am at little or no cost. 
the 12th Parachute Battalion, had a greater distance to cover than the other battalions, and by 2.30am, barely 50% of the men had reported. Lieutenant Colonel A.P. Johnston, their commanding officer, however, decided to move off without further delay to the south of Ronville. His move was made without enemy interference, and the battalion was in position by 4am, covering the southern approaches to the village. By now, the great seaborne assault on the beaches had begun. We had heard the shattering air attack on Wistrom, and the roar of the rockets which preceded the direct assault. We had not heard any firing from the direction of the battery at Mareville. I tried not to be anxious about Terence Otway, but it was not easy. I knew the proposition he was up against, and I knew his determination. All I could really rely upon was this characteristic, and the element of surprise. Little did I guess of the extent of his difficulties. We had so far no contact with James Hill and his 3rd Brigade on the ridge. By 7am most of my headquarters had assembled, but Bobby Bray had not shown up, neither had any in his glider. Had he crashed? Once again worrying would do no good, but worry I did. I left my headquarters in David Baird's capable charge and went off to see how things were on the bridges and how Pine Coffin was faring on the west bank of the Orne. A poet picked me up on the way and also Hugh Kindersley. The latter had come in with us ahead of his brigade, which was not due in until the evening, in order that he should be thoroughly in the picture by the time his troops arrived. All was well when we got to the bridges, but the signs of the hand-to-hand -hand fighting that had taken place there early in the morning were apparent. On the road was an upturned German staff car, which I subsequently heard had run into the fighting. On the far side I could see the smashed-up gliders right up against the wire near the bridge. They looked an awful mess, and yet only one person out of over 70 soldiers of the 52nd who flew in on that hazardous task was injured as a direct result of those crash landings. On the rising ground beyond the canal bridge at Benneville, there was a lot of machine gun mortar and odd rifle fire going on. Things were, in fact, getting sticky. The Germans put in a sharp counter-attack which Pine Coffin's men dealt with. It was a nasty moment, however, because his battalion was sadly under strength. By the following day, a good proportion of those missing men had come in. This was the case in all the parachute battalions. The reports of the large number of missing men in the first 24 hours led to an erroneous impression that our casualties had been far heavier than in fact they were. It was wonderful how these men all rejoined their units, many of them having to come through the German lines. One sergeant major was brought in by a French girl who fitted him up in her brother's clothes, gave him identity papers and lent him a bicycle. In case they were challenged, the girl went with him so that she could speak to the Germans and bluff her way through. She succeeded. Unfortunately, others who were with him in the same area were not so fortunate. Whilst the fighting in the vicinity of Benneville was in progress, there occurred one of those unreal silly things that happen. Down the canal came two German naval coastal craft of the double-ender trawler type, blissfully ignorant of what had happened inland. They, escaping from the hotbed of Wistrom, were setting out for the naval basin at Caen. The troops let them get really close up and then opened fire. When it was too late, the Germans saw the trap they had fallen into and tried to turn round. This was fatal. They ran aground and were captured virtually without a fight. On my return to my headquarters, I was beginning to get in stories of James Hill and the 3rd Parachute Brigade. Terence Otway and the 9th Battalion had done their task at the Mareville Battery. Their story is really an epic. The battalion had dropped at approximately 1am, but they were very scattered. Terence Otway knew the importance of time. So just before 3am, he decided he must move off to his task in spite of the fact that he had only three companies mustering about 50 men in each. His total battalion at that time was not much more than 150 strong. They had not got their special assault stores, they had no engineer or field ambulance personnel, they had no mine detectors, and the glider ball element of their assault had not arrived. Whilst on their advance to the battery position, they learned from their reconnaissance parties, which had gone on ahead, that the preliminary heavy bombing attack on the battery had apparently missed its objective. This bombing attack had moreover fallen uncomfortably near the reconnaissance party. This little party cut gaps in the outer wire fences and penetrated the German minefield. They lay down on the edge of the inner belt of wire, observing the enemy posts and fixing exactly the German positions. They were there joined by the tape-laying parties, but only half of the latter arrived and their tapes were missing. The approaches for the assault they marked by digging heel marks in the ground. In spite of these handicaps, this weak, unsupported battalion 
penetrated the minefields and outer wire defences in the face of heavy fire and finally assaulted and overran the battery position, capturing 22 prisoners. At the close of this action, the battalion was only 80 strong. On completion of this task, the battalion moved off to seize the high ground at the northern end of the ridge. Their objective was the high ground in the vicinity of Le Plain. Whilst they were approaching, they were warned by the French that over 200 of the enemy were entrenched in the area. It was now getting light, and the commanding officer could see where the main opposition was centred. An attack was put in, from which sheer lack of numbers was not successful. The enemy, who turned out eventually to be Russians forced to fight under German officers, told us later that they had been informed by the Germans that if they fell into Allied hands they would be shot as traitors. Be that as it may, they fought hard and stubbornly. This situation was not liquidated until the afternoon when Lovett's men arrived and cleared Le Plain and the whole northern edge of the ridge of the Germans once and for all. James Hill and his headquarters, with about 50% of the Canadian Parachute Battalion, had by now established themselves at Le Menil. The 8th, under Alistair Pearson, had entered Troan and had a firm base established near the road junction southeast of Escoville. The four bridges over the River Dive had all been successfully blown. It was about 10am by now, and this was the situation as I knew it then. Holding the bridges over the canal on the river was the 7th Battalion, fairly well pinned to the ground in a close-in bridgehead just to the north of Benneville. In the southern outskirts of Ronville, known as Le Bas de Ronville, holding foxhole positions which they had dug in, was the 12th Battalion. They were on a reverse slope and well concealed from the front, ideal positions from which to deal with any enemy who topped the crest about a thousand yards to their front. Unless supported by heavy covering fire, accurately directed on the 12th, which at this stage could be discounted, any attempt to cross the open ground towards Ronville would be severely punished. The 12th's right flank rested on the river, where there was more cover. The eastern outskirts of Ronville and the village of Eruviette were thinly held by the 13th Battalion. Facing south, I had, therefore, two battalions at the time not mustering more than about 800 men between them and deployed on a front of nearly 4,000 yards. The troops' tails were well up, and the ground was favourable to the defence. Along the wooded ridge to the east with the 9th Battalion in the north, very weak after their battle at the battery, the Canadians at Le Menil, in what strength I could only guess, and in the southern half of the Bois de Bavon, southeast of Esqueville, the 8th Battalion. Up to this time, I had no artillery of my own, and no artillery support from the Sea Assault Division, who were quite busy enough fighting their own battle in the area of the beaches and the ground just inland. In the extreme north, I had a call on naval gunfire, but this would not reach much beyond Le Plain. It would, I knew, be several hours before I could expect to get any artillery support from west of the Orne, and at the rate things seemed to be going, that's certainly not before the morrow. My own reserve was in Ronville. It consisted of about 60 men of the Independent Parachute Company. In my appreciation of the German reactions to the invasion, I had always considered the most likely course that he would pursue would be to launch a series of small but rather violent immediate counter-attacks. These would be executed by the troops in the immediate vicinity of our landings. And so it had planned out. Later there would be the more serious counter-attack, ordered by the higher formation and executed by the local reserves in the area. This latter form of attack we had not anticipated being launched much before the late morning. At the moment, the two most dangerous approaches into the Bridgehead area seemed to me to be that from Caen up the west bank to Benneville and that from Colombelle up the east bank to Ronville. Had the advance of the 3rd Infantry Division, the Beach Assault Division, gone according to plan, I should by now have been relieved of anxiety on the west bank. They had been expected to reach the bridges by 9am, that is, approximately three hours after their landing on the beaches. I had realised, of course that this must only be a very rough estimate. To summarise, we were very thin on the ground, but we had done what we had set out to do, and we all believed that we could hold what we had gained. By nightfall, we should be reinforced by the air landing brigade, and soon the 3rd Division would be up on our right flank. The remainder of D-Day. The Division holds its gains. I will now attempt to trace the fighting as it developed during the day, firstly west of the bridges and then in and around Ronville, for it was in these areas that our greatest dangers lay. Pine Coffin's dispositions worked well. During the day the battalion withstood eight separate counter-attacks in about company strength and sometimes supported by a small number of tanks. 
In addition, continual attempts were made by small parties of the enemy to infiltrate between his localities. Owing to the lack of wireless and this frequent enemy infiltration, the situation very naturally was often obscure and caused Pinecoff in a good deal of anxiety. Several times the situation appeared serious, but always it was restored by the fine leadership of the junior commanders and the determination and initiative of the troops. Active patrolling was found the most effective means of breaking up the enemy infiltrating parties. Lieutenant N. M. Archdale led a number of successful little patrols of this type. The first respite for the 7th Battalion came about noon, when, in the distance, the sound of pipes could be heard. This was to be the signal from Brigadier Lord Lovett that his commandos of the 1st Special Service Brigade were approaching. It was to be answered by a bugle from the 7th if the way to the bridges was clear. In the noise of the fighting, the bugle could not be heard. Lovett's men bypassed the enemy, and the first meeting between the seaborne and the airborne troops occurred about 1.30pm. That first sound of the pipes meant much to the 7th. It was a stirring moment for those who heard it. It meant that success had been achieved on the beaches and that relief was imminent. A grim battle had been fought for close on 12 hours and the sight of the Green Berets was tonic which invigorated the troops. The commandos were greeted with cheers and handshakes, a heartily deserved tribute to their fine performance in getting through some five hours ahead of any other seaborne troops. They crossed the bridges on their allotted task to the east. The arrival of the commandos did not, therefore, end the troubles of the 7th. The enemy counterattacks continued until 8pm. During the latter part of the afternoon, the company in the southern part of Beneville bore the brunt of the fighting, and the battalion counterattack force had to be put in to relieve the pressure on them. By the evening, the leading elements of the 3rd Division made contact with Pine Coffin's men. At 9.15pm, the 2nd Battalion, the Royal Warwickshire Regiment of the 185th Infantry Brigade, arrived at the bridges. The takeover involved an attack to relieve the forward company of parachutists and allow the evacuation of their casualties. Actually, the position was not finally handed over till midnight. This ended a great day for the 7th Parachute Battalion. They had fulfilled their task. They had held the West Bridgehead and had had 21 hours continuous and hard fighting. The men were tired but well satisfied and proud of their achievements. Casualties had amounted to 60 killed and wounded. It was, however, the Ronville front that really worried me. If we had succeeded in blowing the bridges over the Dive between ourselves and the enemy reserves in the Havre area, we need not expect serious trouble for a little while from the east. At this stage also, it seemed most unlikely that the troops manning the coast defences to the north would turn south on us, for the fear of an extension of our landing eastwards must surely pin these troops to the ground. It was therefore from the south that I was vulnerable. Ronville was fairly quiet until about 11am. It was at that hour we came in for mortaring. The mortaring was heavy, and with it was mixed up high-velocity shells, which seemed to me to come from west of the canal, probably the high ground north of Caen. It quickly became apparent that a properly mounted attack was being developed against us, and, as I had anticipated, from the south. This attack was delivered by the 125th Panzer Grenadier Regiment, with self-propelled guns and tanks, and was launched against the 12th Battalion. This well-supported attack was delivered with skill and with determination. But Johnston, an outstandingly gallant leader, held his positions. The Germans did not succeed in breaking in along this line of the riverbank, and they were severely handled by the 12th in the open. Although one of their tanks actually got into the outskirts of Ronville, the Germans had to withdraw and their casualties were heavy. By 1pm, Ronville was clear and the battle died down. One episode in the fighting outside Ronville stood out. A young officer called Sims, with a handful of men, was holding a position along the line of a hedge. He was attacked by German infantry supported by two self-propelled guns. One of these guns he knocked out. The other, locating his position, lowered its muzzle and at point-blank range shot up his men one by one. Sims held his ground until finally he and only three men were left. Eventually the gun withdrew, having had enough, leaving this gallant and depleted party the victors. The 12th Battalion had had a bad time, and they were considerably under strength. If the Germans developed a second attack of similar strength and vigour, I doubted their ability with the best will in the world to stand up to it. I had by now also put in the Independent Parachute Company, and had nothing in hand. The bridgehead was my major responsibility. This must be held. For this reason, on the arrival of the 1st Special Service Brigade, I diverted Mills Roberts, the leading commando, to the Ronville area. 
The 3rd and 45th Royal Marine Commandos came through and proceeded to the north, where they secured the ground between Salonel and Onfreville and relieved the weak ninth at Le Plain. But the Germans had had enough. They did not attack again that day. By the evening, things were quiet. It had been a strenuous few hours and anxious, but the battle had gone as we had anticipated, and we all felt confident. All objectives had been captured, and what was more important, held. The closing incident for this great day was the fly-in of the 6th Air Landing Brigade. It was a sight I shall never forget. Of a sudden, the dull roar of aircraft could be heard. Then they came, hundreds of aircraft and gliders. The sky was filled with them. We could see the tug aircraft cast off their gliders, and down in great spirals the latter came to the landing zone. Most of the stakes had by now been cleared. The landing took place on both sides of the river and canal. It is impossible to say with what relief we watched this reinforcement arrive. The German reaction was quick. He mortared our headquarters, the village of Ronville, and attempted to mortar the landing zone. His fire was inaccurate and ineffectual. Unfortunately, at my headquarters, poor Jack Norris, my artillery commander, received a terrible throat wound. None of us thought that he could possibly survive. But he did. His loss to us out there was great. Jerry Lacoste, my intelligence officer, was also hit. One of my provost men, standing just behind me, was killed. On the landing zones, however, we were lucky, and only one six-pounder anti-tank gun was hit. This received a direct hit as it was driving off the landing zone, onto the road, and it and its jeep were burned out. We held the high wooded ridge from Auger to Bure, so that the Germans had no direct observation on this ground. The landing zone we used west of the Orne was just to the north of Wiestrom. This also was not under observation, and could not have been suspected by the Germans, for their reaction on this bank was negligible. There has been a little confusion of thought about the success of glider landings in this operation. Facts, I think, will speak for themselves. Of the six gliders detailed for the coup de main assault on the bridges, four were dead on. Of the 85 others that set out that night, 58 were either dead on their appointed landing places or within 3,000 yards of them. Ten were landed over two miles away. and 17 were missing, three of which had forced landings in the United Kingdom. Of the 145 gliders landed on the evening of D-Day, all landed safely on the correct landing zones. Counting anything over two miles away, or missing as being a failure, approximately 88% of the total glider landings were successful. As night closed in, I had six parachute battalions, three commandos, two air landing battalions, plus one company of the 12th Devons, which had been flown in ahead of the remainder of the battalion, the light tanks, one battery of the divisional light artillery, and some 50 anti-tank guns. The arrival of the 3rd Division not only secured the right flank from counterattack west of the canal, but also secured for us our supply line. In fact, we felt we could face the morrow with confidence. The division had passed a critical phase. Although the morrow would certainly bring heavier German attacks, we would be in so much better state to deal with them. The buoyancy that results from the arrival of fresh and vigorous troops is astounding. The Germans attacked our bridges that evening with fighter bombers. We had one lucky escape when a thousand-pounder hit the bridge and bounced off without going off. They bombed us that night, and they mortared and shelled us fairly continuously, but we felt we were getting their measure. In spite of the noise, most of us managed to get two or three hours' sleep. I thanked God for the courage of the troops. They were splendid, quiet in their strength and great in their skill. They lived up to the traditions of the British Army. The light of God was in their eyes.'